work at the Benthic Ecology Lab across the street, and benthic is a big word for on the bottom. And last year I talked about some of the work I do with oysters, and I think Vincent talked me up a little bit last week, and that's what I work with Vincent on is oysters. But today I'm going to talk about one of the other really big projects that we have in the lab, which is on benthic invertebrates, the little guys that live down in the sediment. All of you that are here are probably very well-informed local citizens, and you've probably heard about SERP, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program. And SERP is designed or is hoping to reestablish sheet flow through the Everglades. That's the ultimate goal. So in this figure, we have, this is historically what happened. Water would come through this watershed into Lake Okeechobee and then flow southward as sheet flow through the Everglades. We had our beautiful Everglades. And then we came in and we decided this looked like really good agricultural areas. And so we channelized a lot. And this is where we're at now, where water that comes into the lake is diverted both east and west through the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie estuaries to keep this area drier for agriculture. And the ultimate goal of SERP is to reestablish some of this sheet flow south. So redirect this water and it's a slow moving process because we've been doing our project for about 12 years now and we haven't seen much changes in the water flow patterns. But we meet regularly with the Army Corps and things are moving ahead. We just don't get to see that part yet. We are here, as everyone's aware, and our main question is how are these changing water flow patterns going to affect the communities we have in our river? I think we're all aware this outflow has an effect on the St. Lucie estuary. We made national news last year with our uh, microcystis bloom, turned the estuary green. We have the blooms quite often, so we know that there are effects to what we see visually, but we don't necessarily know what is going on in the river. We know um, the, the salinity goes way down and we have these, these algal blooms which are coming out of the, the lake. The blooms start in the lake and then they come down the channel. But we're not really sure what that's doing to the communities that are already es established in the estuary. There is a sister organization with SERP called RECOVER and it's an acronym but it stands for a lot of words that I can never remember the order of. And so the general idea of RECOVER is that it's a monitoring program. They have groups around the southern part of the state doing different projects to monitor what's going on in the affected ecosystems and hopefully to track the changes in those communities as the water flow pattern does change and see if we're seeing measurable recovery or if we need to balance certain things. So one of the big things that we don't really hear about with SERP is that water levels in the lake aren't just for the surrounding communities, but also for wading birds. And trying to balance the wading bird habitat with the needs of the estuaries on each side has been a big, big problem in the last several years. So th those are things that we're working on, what we learned science and, and what they need to do for the, the public. So the Recover Science Program has several groups. There's the Southern Coastal Systems, which are Florida Bay and the fringing um, coastal systems, the lake proper, the greater Everglades, so the actual center area, and then we have the northern estuaries, which is what I work with. That's both the St. Lucie estuary and the Caloosahatchee estuary. And in those estuary programs, we have oyster monitoring, there's seagrass monitoring, there are marine mammal monitoring, and then we have in-fauna sampling, and that's what we do, and it's definitely the least glamorous, since most people don't know what in-fauna is. And so in-fauna are these guys. We have some really cool pictures of these little bitty gastropods and bivalves and worms that live down in the sediments. And they're a really important part of the community. They provide food resources for a lot of things. And they also help turn over the sediments and aerate and all kinds of things. But nobody thinks about them because you can't really see them. We've been doing this for 11 years now, going on 12, coming up on 12. And we sample quarterly. So every, so four times a year for the past almost 12 years, we've gone out and done in-fauna sampling. So why did we choose benthic invertebrates? Benthic invertebrates are actually only, are only monitored in the St. Lucie estuary. They don't have a sister program in the Caloosahatchee. It's a very specialized type of monitoring because you have to be able to identify these guys when we dye them bright pink. And so that's a, 
that's not glamorous and there aren't a lot of people that know how to do that. And um, we're very lucky we have some very excellent technicians that help us with this project. But the reason we chose benthic invertebrates is because they're, they're sessile. They, they sit in one place, they have very limited mobility, so they can be an indicator of what's going on in that place. They live their whole lives right there. And when bad things happen, they can't swim away. As I said, they're a huge food re resource, so they link the food web in the estuary. So they're an important indicator of what's going on through the rest of the water column, because if there's no food there, then we can't even have those bigger species, which are harder to sample. They have a diverse set of lifestyles and feeding habits, so they represent a wide range of types of feeding. They have filter feeders, which actually get things from the water, but they have deposit feeders that are getting things from the sediments. There are predators of this size. So we have a good range. It's like a little tiny ecosystem that we can monitor all by itself. And then there also are indicator species. These little guys can either be really hardy and you see them and it's a really bad area or they can be really delicate. And so if you see them, you know that things are really good because they only live in very certain conditions. So these individual species, what can they tell us? So this is two species that we have in, in sandy, well-aerated soils. They're generally an indicator of a healthy benthic habitat. We have this little amphipod. His name is Monocorophium. He's got these really cool um, appendages. And then a little chimacean. These are both small crustaceans, so they're relatives of crabs, but they're small and they're kind of weird looking. And if you've ever picked up an oyster shell from the bottom and you've seen little wiggly things, that, that's these guys. Those are amphipods. And some isopods and all kinds. These species, Streblospia, which is a polychaete worm, this is his head, and Mulinia, which is a type of clam, a very small clam, not like you would eat, but like your pinky fingernail. These guys are really hardy, and so if bottom characteristics get really bad, they'll still be around. They can handle low oxygen environments, yucky sediments, they're always around. And they're normally around in a lot, a, a huge abundance, if things get really bad because they're the only things that survive. So that's a really good indication that conditions in that area aren't great if we're seeing a lot of mulinia and a lot of Streblospio. But they're found everywhere because they are hardy, so they can kind of do whatever they want to, but the, number, the, the level of abundance gives us a good indication of what's going on. So to sample these guys, we have 15 fixed sites. So we go back to the same site every quarter. They range through the estuary out into the lagoon. And these two sites were added in, a, in 2007, so about three years after the project started. And then these guys were cut in 2014 because of funding issues. So we still sample all 15 sites, but we don't process these sites because of lack of technical funding. We have a little bit of extra money and so we do have a technician working on them right now to try and get all of the data back in the data database. But um, it's just these sites without the little cross marks um, that gets processed regularly. So that's the full data set that we have. And M14 is the site of particular interest to us because that's where the C44 canal releases. Originally, this site was added because it was thought that it would give us a really good picture of what those outflow events are doing because it's right there. Turns out that's probably not true. The water still seems to be moving pretty fast. It's really narrow right in this area. And so the sediments here stay pretty nice. And so it's actually giving us an interesting uh, picture of what it could look like if we didn't have some of the sedimentation that's a problem with the outflow events. So to take infana samples, we use a petite ponar grab. That's this guy. It's essentially a big pooper scooper. You drop it to the bottom. And it hits the bottom, and it's supposed to trigger every time it hits the bottom, but it does not. And it gets about two handfuls worth of sediment that comes up. And we take three ponar grabs at each of the sites quarterly. And then those ponar grabs are sieved in the field, so we put them in a giant um, tray and get all of the extra sediments out. We don't want to have to go through all of it. So we're sieving, and then what's left are the bigger sediment particles and all of the animals. And those get transferred into a jar. And we preserve the animals in that jar with formalin, so formaldehyde, and we dye them with rose bengal, which is why a lot of the pictures I'm showing you are bright pink. And that rose bengal just helps us figure out what's 
what the animals are in the samples. It makes it a lot easier to see them. We take those samples back to the lab, and the samples have to sit for a few weeks to make sure that the animals take up the dye and are well preserved, and then we transfer them to ethanol before we pick the samples. So I have some really dedicated ladies that sit at a microscope all day long and go through what these samples, and this is what they look like. They're going for these animals, but it's full of all kinds of shell hash and other sediments. And mulinia is some of the bigger things that we find, so a lot of it's smaller than that. Once we have all of the animals picked out, they go through and they sort an ID and occasionally take really cool pictures so that I can show everybody how awesome these animals really are. In addition to the ponar grubs, we also take sediment samples with an Ogeechee core. We take two cores for organic composition and water content. We burn those samples so we get a good idea of how much water is in the sediments and what organic matter is. So muck is defined by both high organic composition as well as high water content. So we're looking to see what the range is there. And then once a year, we take another core, an additional core, for grain size analysis. And that lets us see what the actual grain size composition in those areas are and see if it's changing at all. So over these past 11 years, we've taken over 1,700 grabs. And we've found about 800 taxa. So that's a lot of little animals. And we've found over half a million individuals have been sampled during this project. And of those half a million individuals, 41% are made up of seven worms. Seven worms comprise over almost half of all of these things that we've sampled. We've got this guy and this guy. There's that friend of ours, Dreblastio. Sternapsis, which is one of our technicians' very favorite because he looks so funny. Yeah. <laughs> These guys. And this guy here, who I call Fabio because that's a really hard name to pronounce, he comprises about 20%, just him, 20% of the number of individuals that we've collected. As you can see, Streblaspio, who we talked about earlier, who's such an indicator of bad quality, he shows up in those seven polychaetes. So if I look at the important species, there's an analysis we can do called SIMPER, which essentially looks at all of the sites and pulls out what makes the sites similar and gives us a percentage of, of what these animal, which animals are contributing to the composition. In the full data set, so with all 15 sites, for as long as we have those sites um, processed, we have 11 groups that comprise 56% of those communities. We have amphipods, gastropods, oligo oligochaetes, which you guys are familiar with an oligochaete, an earthworm is an oligochaete, so these are just their marine cousins. And ostracods, which are these teeny tiny little pill looking things. But if we look at just the nine priority sites, so the sites that are still currently funded, we get more groups for about the same percentage, so a more diverse group, and it's about the same, except for there are no ostracods in this group. Ostracods fall out as being important. They tend to be more in the lagoon sites, and those are the sites that got cut. We still have amphipods, but we have a couple of species, a couple of species of gastropods. The polychaetes pop up, and then midges, which are a freshwater species. So since we're focusing on the river system, the freshwater species are playing a bigger importance if we're just looking at our priority sites. But it's also showing us that patchiness is an important part of what's going on in our data set. So these ostracods are only at specific sites out in the lagoon. And so looking at the full data set might be masking what's going on just in the river. And those are things that we need to consider when we're going. And it also shows us boom and bust cycles are important. Because Fabio here went from being 20% of the abundance to only 7% because we cut out a site in which he had a massive population boom. So those are other things that we have to look for. Which species are driving patterns just because they had a big healthy year and there were a ton of them in one sample? This past October, we did sampling. We did it at M7, which is just at the mouth of the St. Lucie River as it's going into the lagoon. We took three ponars and they were full of serapis, which is a type of amphipod. They build these little condos. And they have all these little tubes and they come apart and it looks like an apartment complex and there are serapis, little amphipods in all of them. And there were over 7,000 amphipods in one of those ponar grabs. 
So things like that that happen, we have to consider when we look at the data, because if 7,000 amphipods show up randomly in one site, the rest of the data is not going to know what's going on. Got to got to pull those things out. So we also take environmental characteristics when we're out there. We use a YSI. You take salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, anything that might be important. I threw all of those into an analysis spot, and it came out and essentially said two main components are important. The first one includes salinity, depth, and sediment type. So those are the main three factors. Those are what's really driving the pattern. And then the second component is seasonality. So temperature and dissolved oxygen are going to play a role as well. About 56% of the time, we're below 6 milligrams per liter in oxygen. And 6 milligrams per liter is what's considered fully saturated. So that's what you would want in a healthy water body. You're going to see a lot of that. And there's some fluctuation, of course, but we're always there in the middle of the day. And so we wouldn't expect to see any drop-offs in DO because of seagrass usage overnight. We're not there early enough. But 13% are less than 4 milligrams per liter, which is sort of the cutoff for hypoxia. So we are seeing some low oxygen events. And when we look at the abundance of these animals, and I'm just looking at taxa in the river sites, the sites between where the canal comes out and the lagoon, we thought we might see a correlation between the outflow and the abundance, because the idea is the outflow is causing a drop off in species. But we don't see a clear pattern in that. And that's been the major problem with this data set, is we don't have any clear correlations. These samples are very variable. These animals have boom and bust cycles. There's, they might be here, but they might not be here. So you're not necessarily getting the full picture of what's going on in the whole lagoon, because you're just getting a patch. And we have events like this, where we have this really steep drop off in abundance, but we don't have any outflow to correlate with this. And so there's more going on than just these outflow events. And if we look at diversity, which is a measure of both the species richness, so the number of species, as well as how many of them there are, and can kind of give us a better picture, we do see a little bit more of a pattern where the sites in the river, and I use M5 as an example because putting all of the sites on here would be a mess, um, have a much lower diversity number as you move through time than even the sites in the, fre the freshwater area. So and this is in the North Fork here. And the lagoon sites have the highest diversity. But if you're taking the data set as a whole, this also proves more problems. So we do a lot of things like this to prove why we would whittle it down to just a few sites. But we're definitely seeing different locations are proving or are showing different types. And there is separation among even our sites. But we don't see good correlations between diversity and flow. The black spots are M5, which are right in the middle of the river. And as you can see, they're pretty low diversity no matter what the flow is. M14 is right there at the mouth of the canal. And it's got sort of a middle level diversity and doesn't react much to flow either. And M7 doesn't seem to react to flow much either, though it has a much higher diversity. So we're not seeing the correlation that we really thought we would. But we do see a, a bit of a pattern with Striblospio, our friend the worm that likes bad conditions, that seems to peak with these flow conditions. So he's responding, but maybe nothing, some other things aren't, in a way that is easily identifiable in a large data set. We've got 12 years of data. So with the outflow effects, what we looked for first, we don't see any real correlation between the communities and the outflow. But we do see that the river sites seem to be most affected. And we think this is probably because of the, the level of disturbance that they're experiencing. So it's not just outflow. It's outflow, it's the sediment, it's the fact that there's no consistency in the environmental conditions in those areas. M14, which we thought was going to be a real great indicator of outflow, tends to have pretty stable salinity levels. It's al always pretty low there. Whereas the sites in the river tend to have 0 to 35, depending on what's going on with the outflow. And that change in salinity, plus fairly mucky sediments, is probably causing most of the problems we're seeing. So it's a combination of things, and it probably is linked to the outflow, but not as tightly or as cause and effect as we thought. There's more going on there. And then 
the lagoon sites are pretty healthy. They're pretty stable salinity wise. They have direct access to the inlets and the salinities there are always pretty high. So the communities are able to develop under stable conditions in places like M14 and in M7, but the communities in the middle of the river don't have that luxury. They have to constantly be fluxing. Those are problems we're seeing with the oysters too. It's possible that shutting off the outflow could be really helpful, but maybe just mitigating the outflow could be helpful too in a way that allows the communities to develop under a stable condition as opposed to a constant disturbance event. So this is sort of mimicked in what we see when we do this AMBI index. So this is a, a stoplight color-coded index that managers use to kind of give a picture of what's going on in those sites. And it was developed for marine systems, so that's why a site like this, which is probably not in terrible condition, shows up terrible because it's fully fresh water. But the lagoon sites tend to be green and the river sites tend to be less in less good condition. And this hasn't really changed over the last 11 years. And so, but we see things like M5 is in fair condition, whereas M6 is in moderate condition, and M4 is in poor condition. And when we're out there, the sediments seem fairly similar. And so we started to wonder why sites that seem fairly similar and grouped together in the data would have different ambient indexes. So we went back to the original hypotheses. This, this project is grant funded through the Army Corps and we had to write a proposal to get it funded to do this and they just kept funding us, thank goodness. And what we thought at the time was that extreme salinity shifts were impairing community development, muck was impairing community development, and fine sediment resuspension, so that muck getting churned up with water flow were all negatively affecting the communities, but none of what we had done had actually tested that. So we decided to see if there were a way to test some of these hypotheses that were in the bounds of the grant. So we thought we might do some sediment transects to see if those fixed sites, if their depth was playing a role in what their m ambi condition looked like. So is M6 in better condition because it's closer to shore versus M4, which is out in the middle of the channel? And that's what we decided, so, so that's the idea behind the transects. We're considering sediment transplants where we take muck from the bad sediment, the bad sites that, that rate really poorly and transporting it to an area with a good M ambi rating to see if it's just the sediment or if there's something else going on there. And then we want to do paired sampling where we go out right before an outflow event and then right after an outflow event to see what that picture really is, what absolutely is going on. So what we started with, because this was the easiest one to address, was the muck inhibiting in funnel community development and we're, we'd use the sediment transects to, to test this. And so to do the sediment transects, we had fixed depth sampling at half a meters deep, one and a half meter deep, and two and a half meters deep. The sites that we sample are all within half a meter to three meters in depth. So we just picked a couple of sites along that depth transect which is different. We couldn't use distance from shore because the profile of the bottom in each site is very different. So we used fixed depth sampling. And we just did it at select sites. We don't have a lot of money, so we have to be cautious in what we use. We used M14, M4, 5, 6, and 7. And so these are the sites that are along that major outflow gradient. We decided we'd focus on that. So again, we did our petite ponar grabs. This time we only did two ponars per site. We had three transect points per site times two ponars. It was a lot of work as it was, and I have limited help. Same process, sieved in the field, transferred to a jar and preserved before being sorted and ID'd. We also did the sediment samples. We took two samples for water content, and we did take a grain size sample as well at all of these. When I first started looking at the data, what it seemed to be saying is that site differences were overpowering the transect points. All three transect points are at M5 were more like each other than the two deepest points at, say, M4 and M5. We see that here. We have groupings, some groupings of the depth, but mostly groupings of the sites. And when we looked at the biological components, so the animals, species richness, and abundance showed the same general pattern. We have this M14, and M7 don't show any, any pattern with depth, 
just the middle sites do, where their most diverse and most abundant animals are in the shallow and it tapers off towards the deep water. And so that wasn't super surprising. We know M14 and M7 are in better conditions. They have better soils. Semper analysis, I told you guys about the, we're looking at the similarity between sites using the percentage of species. So that's what we did again here. And we found a decrease in the number of species that are comprising the biggest about, amount of the abundance with depth at all sites. But we aren't really sure what's going on with those species because we did this last June in the middle of that outflow event. And so all of our species are freshwater species that we haven't really seen before. So we're still looking into the literature to see what's, what these species may indicate because we're just not familiar with them. Okay, so this is a really cool graph that one of our technicians made. And so you have coarse grains up here, sand here, and silt. And as the percentages move, their, move towards silty, they're gonna move this way. And so the coarse sand is pretty, uh, is, is what we really like. That's M7s up here. Um, and then silty is the more mucky type sediments. And so we do see that the silt tends to be in the deepest part. We have M14 is still pretty coarse sediment in the middle. So like I have said, M14 actually looks a lot better than we thought it would. Sediment did show a pattern of very silty sediments in the deepest part of the transect. And this is another way of looking at the same data, just to give you an idea of the breakdown at each of the transect points. And so things that jumped out at me are M4, and that middle has, the middle transect point has a lot of coarse sediments. Of course, the reason for that is that M4 right there has a relic oyster reef underneath it, and so several of the things, I think our grain size sample got a giant oyster shell in the middle of it. <laughs> That makes a difference when you're looking at things. And then uh, M7 has this really large percentage of silty sediments in the deep part, which is surprising to us because we don't see a lot of silts there. So we started thinking about what we had seen in the field, and M7 lies right on a channel. And so we really think that the sample, the biological sample, the ponar sample, was on one side of the boat. We take off either side of the boat just for efficiency's sake. And the biological sample got sandy sediments, and the sediment sample got in the channel in the mucky sediments, and so we have a little bit of a mismatch there. We're not sure that that's what happened, but we think that's what happened. But in general, we see this increase in silty sediments as we move deeper. So there is a little bit of a correlation between the loss on ignition, so how much water is in the sediment, and the depth that's echoing the silty percentage as you move deeper. But M7 and M14 aren't really following this pattern. And species richness decreases, but we've got M7 and M14 making a mess with my data. And that's echoed in abundance as well. So in general, we found that we probably are skewing the data a little bit by having these fixed sites. And the depth is really indicating what can live there. So there are healthy communities in the river. They're just much closer to shore where the sediments are nicer. And we think, but we don't know, that the sediment is part of the outflow with all of the extra fine grain things that are suspended in those outflow events and in runoff, regular runoff, that they get to the river. And it settles into those deep dredged channels and causes a less than happy ecosystem. So we want to keep looking at the long-term trends, but we want to narrow our focus down to those few sites in the river just to see what's going on with them and looking at the sediment. And I was lucky enough to get some data on benthic infauna from the lagoon from the 1970s from a recently retired professor that I'm hoping to delve into. We're also going to keep investigating the common species and some of those freshwater species that we found that we don't know anything about and look at their abundance patterns and their distributions. Maybe there's an indicator that we can look for that would just that one species might give us a better um, idea of what's going on. And the feeding strategies, just to see if those species are, if there are different feeding strategies in different areas of the river and what that might mean for the food webs in general. And our next major project along this line is the outflow-based sampling. So we're working on pairing with, we have, contacts at the Army Corps, so we're working on making sure that they let us know when the outflows are going to start, 
so that we can go out right before outflow starts and then hopefully get a much better picture if we have right before and right after an outflow event we can see what these communities really do respond. With that, I have to thank the lovely ladies that work with me in the Benthic Lab that do most of this sorting and identification with the help of some volunteers and our funding sources. And with that, I will take any questions.